Fourteen delightful days passed almost before I noticed their flight. Then, aroused to the sense of what was proper among mortal circumstances as we were, I pointed out to Kitty that an engagement ring was the outward and visible sign of her dignity as an engaged girl, and that she must forthwith come to Hamilton's to be measured for one. Up to that moment, I give you my word, we had completely forgotten so trivial a matter. To Hamilton's we accordingly went on the 15th of April 1885. Remember that, whatever my doctor may say to the contrary, I was then in perfect health, enjoying a well-balanced mind and an absolutely tranquil spirit. Kitty and I entered Hamilton's shop together, and there, regardless of the order of affairs, I measured Kitty's finger for the ring in the presence of the amused assistant. The ring was a sapphire with two diamonds. We then rode out down the slope that leads to the Comermere Bridge and Pelody's shop. While my whaler was cautiously feeling his way over the loose shale, and Kitty was laughing and chattering at my side, while all Simla, that is to say as much of it as had then come from the plains, was grouped round the reading room and Pelody's veranda, I was aware that someone, apparently at a vast distance, was calling me by my Christian name. It struck me that I had heard the voice before, but when and where I could not at once determine. In the short space it took to cover the road between the path from Hamilton's shop and the first plank of the Comermere Bridge I had thought over half a dozen people who might have committed such a solecism, and had eventually decided that it must have been some singing in my ears. Immediately opposite Pelody's shop my eye was arrested by the sight of four Japanese in black and white livery, pulling a yellow-paneled, cheap, bizarre rickshaw. In a moment my mind flew back to the previous season and Mrs. Wessington with a sense of irritation and disgust. Was it not enough that the woman was dead and done with, without her black and white servitors reappearing to spoil the day's happiness? Whoever employed them now I thought I would call upon, and ask as a personal favor to change her Japanese livery. I would hire the men myself, and, if necessary, buy their coats from off their backs. It is impossible to say here what a flood of undesirable memories their presence evoked. Kitty, I cried, there are poor Mrs. Wessington's Japanese turned up. Again. I wonder who has them now. Kitty had known Mrs. Wessington slightly last season, and had always been interested in the sickly woman. What? Where? she asked. I can't see them anywhere. Even as she spoke, her horse, swerving from a laden mule, threw himself directly in front of the advancing rickshaw. I had scarcely time to utter a word of warning when, to my unutterable horror, horse and rider passed through men and carriage as if they had been thin air. What's the matter, cried Kitty, what made you call out so foolishly, Jack? If I am engaged I don't want all creation to know about it. There was lots of space between the mule and the veranda and, if you think I can't ride, there. Whereupon Wilful Kitty set off, her dainty little head in the air, at a hand gallop in the direction of the band stand, fully expecting, as she herself afterwards told me, that I should follow her. What was the matter? Nothing, indeed. Either that I was mad or drunk, or that Simla was haunted with devils. I reined in my impatient cob, and turned round. The rickshaw had turned too, and now stood immediately facing me, near the left railing of the Comermere Bridge. Jack! Jack, darling! There was no mistake about the words this time, they rang through my brain as if they had been shouted in my ear. It's some hideous mistake, I'm sure. Please forgive me, Jack, and let's be friends again. The rickshaw hood had fallen back, and inside, as I hope and daily pray for the death I dread by night, sat Mrs. Keith Wessington, handkerchief in hand, and golden head bowed on her breast. How long I stared motionless I do not know. Finally, 
I was aroused by my groom taking the whaler's bridle and asking whether I was ill. I tumbled off my horse and dashed, half fainting, into Pelides for a glass of cherry brandy. There two or three couples were gathered round the coffee tables discussing the gossip of the day. Their trivialities were more comforting to me just then than the consolations of religion could have been. I plunged into the midst of the conversation at once, chatted, laughed and jested with a face, when I caught a glimpse of it in a mirror, as white and drawn as that of a corpse. Three or four men noticed my condition, and, evidently setting it down to the results of over. Many pegs, charitably endeavored to draw me apart from the rest of the loungers. But I refused to be led away. I wanted the company of my kind, as a child rushes into the midst of the dinner party after a fright in the dark. I must have talked for about ten minutes or so, though it seemed an eternity to me, when I heard Kitty's dear voice outside inquiring for me. In another minute she had entered the shop, prepared to roundly upbraid me for failing so signally in my duties. Something in my face stopped her. Why, Jack, she cried, what have you been doing? What has happened? Are you ill? Thus driven into a direct lie, I said that the sun had been a little too much for me. It was close upon five o'clock of a cloudy April afternoon, and the sun had been hidden all day. I saw my mistake as soon as the words were out of my mouth, attempted to recover it, blundered hopelessly and followed Kitty, in a regal rage, out of doors, amid the smiles of my acquaintances. I made some excuse, I have forgotten what, on the score of my feeling faint, and cantered away to my hotel, leaving Kitty to finish the ride by herself. In my room I sat down and tried calmly to reason out the matter. Here was I, Theobald Jack Pansy, a well-educated Bengal civilian in the year of Grace 1885, presumably sane, certainly healthy, driven in terror from my sweetheart's side by the apparition of a woman who had been dead and buried eight months ago. These were facts that I could not blink. Nothing was further from my thought than any memory of Mrs. Wessington when Kitty and I left Hamilton's shop. Nothing was more utterly commonplace than the stretch of wall opposite Pelides. It was broad daylight. The road was full of people, and yet here, look you, in defiance of every law of probability, in direct outrage of nature's ordinance, there had appeared to me a face from the grave. Kitty's Arab had gone through the rickshaw, so that my first hope that some woman marvelously like Mrs. Wessington had hired the carriage and the coolies with their old livery was lost. Again and again I went round this treadmill of thought, and again and again gave up baffled and in despair. The voice was as inexplicable as the apparition. I had originally some wild notion of confiding it all to Kitty, of begging her to marry me at once, and in her arms defying the ghostly occupant of the rickshaw. After all, I argued, the presence of the rickshaw is in itself enough to prove the existence of a spectral illusion. One may see ghosts of men and women, but surely never of coolies and carriages. The whole thing is absurd. Fancy the ghost of a hill man. Next morning I sent a penitent note to Kitty, imploring her to overlook my strange conduct of the previous afternoon. My divinity was still very wroth, and a personal apology was necessary. I explained, with a fluency born of night-long pondering over a falsehood, that I had been attacked with a sudden palpitation of the heart, the result of indigestion. This eminently practical solution had its effect, and Kitty and I rode out that afternoon with the shadow of my first lie dividing us. Nothing would please her save a canter round Jacko. With my nerve still unstrung from the previous night I feebly protested against the notion, suggesting Observatory Hill, Judo, the Boilagaginch Road, anything rather than the Jacko Round. Kitty was angry and a little hurt, so I yielded from fear of provoking further misunderstanding, and we set out together towards Chota Simla. We walked a greater part of the way, and, according to our custom, cantered from a mile or so below the convent to the stretch of level road by the Sanjoli Reservoir. The wretched horses appeared to fly, and my heart beat quicker and quicker as we neared the crest of the ascent. 
My mind had been full of Mrs. Wessington all the afternoon, and every inch of the Jacko Road bore witness to our old-time walks and talks. The boulders were full of it, the pines sang it aloud overhead, the rain-fed torrents giggled and chuckled unseen over the shameful story, and the wind in my ears chanted the iniquity aloud. As a fitting climax, in the middle of the level men called the Lady's Mile, the horror was awaiting me. No other rickshaw was in sight, only the four black and white Japanese, the yellow paneled carriage, and the golden head of the woman within, all apparently just as I had left them eight months and one fortnight ago. For an instant I fancied that Kitty must see what I saw, we were so marvelously sympathetic in all things. Her next words undeceived me, not a soul in sight. Come along, Jack, and I'll race you to the reservoir buildings. Her wiry little Arab was off like a bird, my whaler following close behind, and in this order we dashed under the cliffs. Half a minute brought us within fifty yards of the rickshaw. I pulled my whaler and fell back a little. The rickshaw was directly in the middle of the road, and once more the Arab passed through it, my horse following. Jack, Jack, dear. Please forgive me, rang with a wail in my ears, and, after an interval, it's all a mistake, a hideous mistake. I spurred my horse like a man possessed. When I turned my head at the reservoir works the black and white liveries were still waiting, patiently waiting, under the grey hillside, and the wind brought me a mocking echo of the words I had just heard. Kitty bantered me a good deal on my silence throughout the remainder of the ride. I had been talking up till then wildly and at random. To save my life I could not speak afterwards naturally, and from Sanjoli to the church wisely held my tongue. 